If you would, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm just going to read verses 22 through 24. First Corinthians 1 verse 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And I'm just going to stop right there because I've got to stop somewhere. Before I get into this, i got something I want to say. Um, I don't know if you've heard this question or if you've heard a variation of this question from someone but basically the question is this where do you people get that gospel or get your gospel well to say it flat out we got it from God because as far as I know the very first time we have it recorded in the scripture of the gospel being preached it was in the garden of Eden and it was God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, I believe, an appearance of Jesus Christ, the son, preached it to Adam and to Eve. The seed of the woman is going to bruise his heel on the head of the serpent. And that gospel, that good news, has never changed. It's been expounded upon. It's been expanded upon. There are more details, a lot more details have been filled in from that first time. But that, as far as we know, is the first preaching of the good news and it came from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been told more, but we have never been told different than that. Because the burnt offering, the description of the burnt offering is the gospel. The Passover lamb and the Lord's Passover is the gospel. Since those days we have learned by the scriptures who is the seed of the woman. We have been taught who the Lamb of God is. It's Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The gospel has never changed. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. And God himself gave us his gospel. And that's the only reason we can call it ours. Because he gave himself to us. First John 1 and verse 5 put it this way. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And John did hear it from him. From his very lips when he walked on his earth. And declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Jesus Christ is our gospel. Not only did he give himself for us, he gave himself to us. And he gave us his gospel. Because we have this gospel, his gospel, from him. Now the reason people don't recognize it is ignorance. That's all it is. Well, this is the gospel that was preached in this country for 100 years, over 100 years. Now it's died out of favor. It's died out of favor. People have started picking up everything else. But now they think we're preaching something new, Walter. And I got nothing new, not even today. 
This isn't a new gospel. It's, it's the old time religion, if you really want to put it that way. Because we're going back to the Garden of Eden, actually before. When God the Father chose us in his son before the foundation of the world. That's old time religion. It's just not heard. It's not preached. But I got nothing new today. All we got now today is the same thing that John wrote down and Paul wrote down and everyone else wrote down about Jesus Christ. So, in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 1, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The first thing I want to point out here is there are two distinct types of people referred to in this verse. The Jews and the Greeks. Now, in this epistle, I just said it a little while ago, was written by the Apostle Paul, who used to be called Saul of Tarsus. Now, Apostle Paul was born and raised a Jew. But he lived in a little place nowadays, it's, it's in Turkey, the city of Tarsus, that's where it was. So Paul, where he was born, was surrounded by Jews, by Romans, by Greeks, and by Turks. Now he did say, from a youth, he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel in the Jewish religion. But you can tell, if you've read his writing, that the Apostle Paul was an intelligent man. He was well schooled. He was capable of learning as a youth and willing to learn, which is sometimes even separate from capable. Paul had been around Jews and Greeks and this is where he's made this little division that he's talking about right now. Of course, when the Lord Jesus Christ met him on the road to Damascus, Paul's education started all over again. <laughs> Just like yours did. Just like mine did. Because when you meet Christ, guess what? Everything changes, including you. And the things you once believed, you don't believe anymore. And the things you didn't even know, you love. I, I, it's amazing to me. But Paul here is talking about the people of the world. That's the context. I'll back up a little bit here in just a bit. And the people of the world are divided into two types here by Paul. This is what he's talking about. The Jews and the Greeks. And by this I'm going to infer the religious and the secular. That's what it is. That's what he's, he's teaching us. The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. They are both in the world, they are both of the world and yet they want two different things. Now this is what they want. Paul is telling us the desires of the religious and the secular and it's no different now not a bit because man as he is born the natural man has not changed now the first thing he says is the Jews require a sign what's wrong with a sign because here what we're talking about is a miracle that's what we're talking about miracles signs wonders that's what we're talking about that's what Paul's talking about saying the Jews require a sign but you know, from the context of the verses, that seems to be in a negative slant. What's wrong with a sign? Well, they require a sign. That's a, there's, there's a nice little word there. Okay? They don't require God, Paul says. Paul says they require a sign. And here's something you might want to know about a sign. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Now who said that? 
Jesus Christ said that. Now he said he was going to give them a sign. One sign. There's one sign. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there'll be no sign given except the sign of Jonah. Three days in the belly of a fish and spit out on dry ground. Now what was Jesus Christ referring to there? He was referring to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the only sign that's going to go to a wicked and adulterous generation. Now, let me refer you to something else. Was that sign going to do anyone any good by itself? And the word is no. Absolutely not. Because I'll refer you to the account, not parable, account of the rich man and Lazarus. I think Walter read about it the other day. That rich man was in dead and in hell he lifted up his eyes and he saw Lazarus who was also dead but in Abraham's bosom and comforted. And he said, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus back to my brothers. Abraham said, no. He said, wait a minute. No, send them back because my brothers, not for me, but for my brothers, my family, my kinsmen. Let them speak to them and they'll hear him. And Abraham said, no, they won't. And this is Christ relating this. Abraham told that rich man, he says, they have the prophets. They have the law. They have the testimony. They have the Old Testament. The truth of God about Jesus Christ right there. And he said, oh, they won't, they won't listen to that, but if one come back from the dead, him they'll hear. And Abraham said, no, they wouldn't. Because if they will not hear the law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even though one rose from the dead and one did rise from the dead. The greatest sign this world has never seen. And the ones who saw it didn't believe it. Except the ones it was given to. A sign and a miracle. I've said it from before here. Before, a sign and a miracle have never saved anyone. Our Lord did them in plenteous. And they found fault with every one. You healed a man on the Sabbath and made him carry his bed. You give sight to a blind eyes, but you're a sinner. And they took up stones to stone him for a miracle. He cast out demons into a herd of pigs. And they asked him to depart and please don't ever come back. Miracles never did anyone any good. And these Jews are seeking after a sign. They're seeking after the wrong thing. Because they're seeking after a thing and not a person. Now... The Greeks are seeking after wisdom. The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Well, Paul had just deal with this in verses 17 to 21 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. We're not using this world's wisdom to preach his gospel. Right. And I'll throw this in for free. Baptism ain't the gospel. Right. Otherwise, Paul would have said he sent me to baptize because he did send him to preach the gospel. But baptism is not the gospel. That's just for free. Then it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish 
the wisdom of this world. And I can tell you exactly how he does. Because you can tell it for yourself in your own little lifetime. Even as young as Emily is over here in Trent. Wisdom has changed. Wisdom has changed. I mean, I've seen it in my lifetime plenty. What they used to say was science is now foolishness. They said it was true. And guess what? They turned out to be wrong. And now they're teaching something totally different. Why do your textbooks change? Because, guess what? The wisdom of this world changes. God's made it foolish. If you have eyes to see. If you have eyes to see. This is what we are surrounded by. And these are the desires of the people who live in this world. They either want a sign, some kind of religious thing. Or they want some wisdom to explain everything. And it cannot be done. And they won't have it. Now, how much as we are we as believers to pander to these people? Okay, I cheated. Pander's a bad word. You're not supposed to pander to people, Walter. But that's what this world does. That's what this world does. We are not supposed to. The world does pander to its own. The religious pander to the religious and the secular pander to the secular. Because both the religious and the secular have what is described in the scriptures as itching ears. And guess what? People whose ears itch want somebody to scratch it for them. And they want teachers with itching ears. And I'll tell you this, we are not to pander. But Paul told us about these two kinds of people for a reason. Because everyone in the world either did or does belong in this category. Because if you don't belong in that category, you used to. I used to. I used to. I was secular. Now, talking with Walter, he part of the time was religious and part of the time was secular. Hey, it can go either way. And, it, and you can go from one to the other. But guess what? When Saul's said and done, you haven't gone anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or you're secular. Paul's going to show us that in just a second. Some are more religious than others. Some are more secular than others. That part doesn't matter. But these are the people in the world, of the world, that we have to deal with. The question is, what are we, as believers, not just preachers, but as believers, those who used to be that way, what are we to do for these people and with these people? Paul answers that question. <coughs> Verse 23, but, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. These two verses, the one previous and this one here are tied together with that little conjunction, but he described those two kinds of people and then he describes what we are to do. Because what does it say? But we preach Christ crucified. They don't preach Christ crucified. Not even the religious ones. Not even the religious ones. They'll preach anything else and everything else. And they do. But we are to preach Christ crucified. And then he tells us how they're going to act. Under the Jews a stumbling block. And under the Greeks foolishness. The religious require a sign and the secular seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ. I like that. 
He's the only answer we have for the religious and for the secular. He's the only message we have for the religious and for the secular. Wait a minute now. Aren't you supposed to be sensitive to seekers? They, they use that term now. Seeker sensitive. Are you seeker sensitive? Yes, I am. But we preach Christ. That's what Paul said to do. What about what they want? We preach Christ. What about what they seek? We preach Christ. He's the answer even if they don't know the question. I said that before. I'll say, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter whether they know the question or not. We got the answer. That's what we got to preach. We have to preach him. Believers and ministers alike are to be cognizant of the fact. They're supposed to realize it and they need to understand it. What men do want, what men do require, what men do seek. And we preach Christ. It's that simple. And it's that complex all at one time. We don't preach signs and we don't preach wisdom. That's what Paul saying. That's what they want, but we preach Christ. And not only that, Paul's very specific, we preach Christ crucified. Crucified. You know what he means by that? Well, he sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ... Be, should be made of none effect. Paul was sent to preach Christ crucified. Now, it says to some, well, here in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. And we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. If you lay it down in front of them, they'll trip over it and hurt themselves. And we preach Christ crucified. I used to trip over stuff. I used to think the gospel was foolishness. I used to think going to church was foolishness. I only did it to keep peace with my mother. And I'll admit that wholeheartedly. That's the only reason because I didn't, it was easy enough not to make her mad. Especially, now you all know my Catholic background, see. Since the Mass is essentially the same, if you go on Saturday evening, you don't have to go on Sunday morning. Now, Mom wasn't all that happy about it because, see, Saturday night I was going out chasing women. I was a kid. I was young, but that's what I did. I did my duty, and I kept my mother satisfied. That ain't the gospel. That's not believing God. That was keeping peace in my house, my mom's house. The gospel to me, even what little gospel was there in a Catholic church, was foolishness. That's all it was to me. I mean, I, I was a good Catholic boy. I did what I wanted during the week, and I went to church on Saturday or Sunday. But in these two categories that we saw in verse 22, now in verse 23, both categories come back to one category. They don't want Christ crucified preached to them. They won't have it. It's a stumbling block or it's foolishness. Either way, whether it's a stumbling block or it's foolishness, what is it? They are without Jesus Christ. Because we preach Christ crucified and they won't have it. So these two categories come back to one. Back to the world. Religious and secular. It doesn't matter. Both of these categories say exactly the same thing. We will not have this man to reign over us. 
because that's what it means to preach Christ crucified. You're preaching the reigning Christ. He was crucified on that cross, but he didn't stay there. He was buried for three days, but he didn't stay there. He rose again from the grave and walked upon the earth, but he didn't stay here. He ascended up to the Father and now is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high and he is expecting his enemies to be put under his feet. Amen. To preach Christ crucified is to preach the reigning King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they won't have this man. Neither one of them. They may both pay lip service to Jesus Christ's teaching, maybe his basic goodness. But they will not admit to or believe in his power and his deity. Maybe they'll say something nice about his sacrifice. Isn't that nice? He gave his life for his people, you know, or for his friends. They might say he's a really big martyr. He's not a martyr. But they won't tell you anything and don't believe anything about his substitution or his redemption. Because here's the crux of the matter. When it comes to Christ crucified being preached in the spirit, in his fullness, they both, religious and secular, are without him. They're without Christ. Because the religious and the secular have both been shown here by the Apostle Paul to be one. To be one. And now Paul shows us the real division. He went and showed us the religious and the secular separately. And he put them back together when you put Christ in the mix. And now it says, still speaking of we preach Christ crucified... Verse 24, but unto them which are called. What? Both Jew and Greek. Yeah, what? Both Jew and Greek. Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. This is another but. But unto them. We've gone from the Jews and the Greeks, the religious and the secular, to them which are called called Christ crucified preached is a stumbling block and foolishness and the power of God and the wisdom of God what's the difference unto them which are called and he says it, both Jew and Greek, both religious and secular have been called unto Christ. Jew and Gentile, bond and free, rich or poor, it matters not. What does it say of believers? What did Christ say? You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You used to be in the world and of the world. Now you're just in the world, but you're not of the world. What's the difference? His calling. His calling. The difference is whether you believe or you reject his gospel. That's the way it's shown. That's the way it's shown. The same gospel message is rejected and received at the same time by different people. And it can be the same sermon. What's the difference? Some are called and some are not. That's what it says. They are both Jews and Greeks and they are called. And they are called. What's that mean? Well, that brings us here to the question, who makes you to differ? What do you have that you haven't received? Well, I got a scripture for you. Hebrews 4 and verse 2, you don't have to turn there. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Now, I know the reference to the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament, excuse me, unbelievers, 
in the Old Testament saints. Unto us, the gospel was preached as well as unto them, because it still holds true today. But the word preached did not profit them. And he tells you why. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Those called, but unto them which are called, they believe the gospel. Those to whom Christ is the wisdom of God and Christ is the power of God, they believe him. Why? Because they have been given faith. Now that's the noun. That's not your believing. Our believing does not make anything so. We believe because we know it is so. <coughs> or because he is so. We have been given faith, his faith, and it was given by him who's the author and the finisher of faith. Amen. And we know all men have not faith. I know that's a big thing. You want to fan a little spark in somebody and build up the flames of faith. Well, there isn't any. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Is there a problem with that? What, what's, the, what's the description of unreasonable and wicked men? They're men that don't have faith. And it doesn't matter whether they're Jew or they're Greek, religious or secular. If they have not faith, they will not have the message of Jesus Christ crucified. And if you have faith, you will have that message. You will know the truth and the truth shall make you free because he is the truth. But unto them which are called, they believe. Both Jew and Greek. Faith is the gift of God. Faith is the fruit of the Spirit. And what's that mean? Well, now those two categories, religious and secular, are one category. And they're lumped together. And now we have the other category. Those who have been pulled out of the first one. Jew and Gentile. Which are called by our Lord. And by his gospel. And believe. Believers see Christ in his gospel. Others just see foolishness or a stumbling block. And this is the message we have. This is all the message we have. Is Christ crucified. This is the gospel that we've been given because he is our message. The gospel of God, the gospel of God's dear son, the gospel of Christ Jesus, my gospel, Paul said. The good news of the crucified Christ, his substitution, his being made sin, his sacrificial death, which satisfied God's holy justice. He justified many because he bore the sins of many. His acceptance by the Father and resurrection from the dead and all the sins of God's people have been punished to God's satisfaction. The crucified Christ. It's all included plus more. But to preach the crucified Christ, you have to preach him and what he has done, what he is doing, and what he shall do. You can't preach him too high. He's the God of all glory. And we don't know nothing about glory. You can't preach him too high. Now, if by doing that, it seems like you're preaching man low, well, you can't preach man too low either.
I read it at the beginning. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Christ crucified is a message of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who is this King of Glory, strong in battle? Some people don't want to know. I hope you do want to know. Because he is our message. He is our gospel. Because simply put, the gospel message is this. Christ is all. What do you mean? What about redemption? It's Christ. What about sanctification? It's Christ. Justification? It's Christ. He's our justification. You understand? It states, he stated, that the Spirit blows whether it listeth. You can't tell where it comes and where it goes. And then he says, I'm going to send him. He's going, he's right now, he's with you, and he's going to be in you. You understand? If you know Christ, if you believe Christ, you have in you the Holy Spirit of God. And that boggles my mind, Walter. I mean, that bothered me. I mean, it's, I, I, I can't really comprehend it. Because especially when you start thinking of, this is the third person of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. Inside every one of his believers. And here's the thing. He's called the Holy Spirit. He's called the Holy Ghost. He's also called the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. And Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know where you get that from? You get that from being hearing Christ crucified, preached. The world won't have this because the world won't have him. We only have this because he has given himself to us. No matter what men require, no matter what men seek, no matter what men desire, we preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because he is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, it's of faith that it might be of grace. We got to know who we have to deal with in this world and in the next. And if you know him, you know all. You don't have to worry about the wisdom of this world. You may have to deal with it, but you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about the religion of this world. You may have to deal with it, but you don't have to worry about it. Because you've been there. You've been there, and he has called you out. And he's called you to himself. And you no longer see it as foolishness or a stumbling block. Praise God. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your work, your will in this world, and your salvation which you have given to your people. We ask for your blessings to continue. And you, we know you've promised they have. Be with Walter as he comes to preach your gospel. And give us the ears to hear, and eyes to see, and a heart to understand. And we will praise you and honor you as best we can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.